Coming up, we have an interview with one of rock and roll's wild men and how he came up with one of those iconic riffs of the 1970s and uh, what inspired him to pick up a guitar in the first place. This icon, he's always entertaining, he even jams a little bit for us. You're gonna love it. The story's next on Professor of Rock. Hey music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You wanna be a part of a music community where we curate the best of the rock and roll era through interviews, stories, history, the whole thing. Make sure to subscribe below right now. You also need to click that bell so that you always get our daily content. Take a look at our Patreon. You're gonna find more content there, special stuff. Also, take a look at our merch below. You'll find some stuff that I, I think you'll enjoy. Ted Nugent, just saying the name brings steam from uh, all four corners. Here at POR, we focus on the music though. No one can deny the talent and the passion that Mr. Nugent has for rock and roll. Since bursting onto the scene, he's swung a mighty ax and he's given us plenty of hard rock to get everybody riled up. I had an opportunity to talk with him about his music, including the story of his ferocious 1977 rocker, Cat Scratch Fever. Actually became his biggest hit. It went to number 30 on the Billboard Hot 100. It's a lot bigger than this chart position though. Theodore Anthony Nugent started as the lead guitarist and occasional lead vocalist of the Amboy Dukes. After the band dissolved, Uncle Ted started on a solo career. Of course, Nugent is notable for his Gibson Birdland, his bluesy and frenzy guitar playing, and his energetic live shows. Despite his wide-ranging and original uh, vocal chops, Nugent recorded and toured with other lead singers in his early solo career. There was Brian Howe, a Meatloaf, and Derek St. Holmes, among others. He took on lead vocals later on, though, and he was uh, also part of the rock supergroup uh, Damn Yankees with Tommy Shaw's Sticks, Jack Blades, and Night Ranger. They had the number three hit High Enough in 91. We'll have to cover that for sure. Can you take me Coming up, Ted tells us all. Now, as we go into this interview, I want to recognize our sponsor, Zenii, or the brand of glasses I wear every single day. So I've heard personally from a lot of our viewers on this channel, and they purchased the Blue Blocks feature from Zenni, you know, that protects your eyes from digital blue light. They've all loved it. You can do the same at zenni.com. You just add them as a feature when you order. It's been a game changer for me, and I know it'll help you as well. Here's Ted. Well, Sammy Hager, we both come from the same rhythm and blues school of soulful, authoritative, you better do what little Richard tells you to do music. <laughs> and so we were all raised on the black heroes that founded this great, great throbbing music. And we pay tribute to them. I think we have actually specified for the last 45 years that when we go on stage, we try to emulate James Brown and the Famous Flames. As far as energy and piss and vinegar and spirit and positive, positive force and tightness. That rhythm and blues Motown Funk Brother tightness. And that's why I think the audience are so, so impacted by our music. We feel we have a job to do to pay our dues to those founding fathers who created this throttling type of music. A little while ago, you said something about Absorb All Things, Rolling Stones, Cream, Little Richard, Chuck Berry, Motown. I think all the uh, British invaders uh, from the Beatles and Stones and Yardbirds, Who, Kinks, all of them, they have sp specifically articulated over the years that if it wasn't for Howlin' Wolf and Muddy Waters and Bo mm -hmm. Diddy and Chuck Berry and Little Richard and Jerry Lee Buddy Lewis Hall, and yeah. Elvis, and the Motown impact, those funk brothers, those mighty, mighty rhythm gods, the Motown funk brothers. So they articulated what turned me on before there was a British invasion. Before there was ever a Kinks, I was playing Johnny B. Good and Bo Diddley music. Hey, Bo Diddley. So we, we got off on the right foot. 
I was lucky to be born in 1948, right after Les Paul electrified the yeah. damn thing. And when Chuck Berry immediately, I, you know, you got to you got to genuflect at the altar of Chuck Berry. He invented it. I mean, the cadence, the, the drive, the throttle. There was nothing like that before him. So we, we acknowledge that. We never lose track of that. In fact, we do a tribute every night to all those founding fathers. It is that soulfulness, right. that authoritative, uppity, defiant, uh, gung-ho spirit of the music that no matter where we play, no matter what the conditions might be, we're playing for those guys. Let's go back to the beginning, 1968 with the Amboy Dukes. You had your first top 20 hit, Journey to the Center of the Mind. Tell me about that song, writing that song. Do you remember that? Good grief, I do, you know. <laughs> but you gotta, you're got you going to have to go back a little before that, because that was 67 when I wrote that song, yeah. 1967. Journey to the Center of the Mind. I was just playing the patterns. Everybody picks up a guitar, and everybody plays the lick that ended up in Journey to the Center of Mine and Barracuda. I don't know, maybe it's a rip off of, uh, of uh, Bonanza. Just to get a rolling thunder going, you know? As today, <laughs> and when you walked in here, I was beating on my Gibson Birdland. I love the music, so I always had a guitar either on or getting ready to be put on, or terminally on. Yeah. I love to play. So you're always experimenting with adventure on the guitar neck. You're trying to find, you're trying, you're trying to find noises and sounds. Yeah. And and thank God for the jazz and blues guys. I mean, going back to John Coltrane and Yusef Latif and Sun Ra, but the Howlin' Wolves, a lot of that stuff was dissonant. A lot of that was down and dirty and nasty and really grinding. And so you'd pick up on a note that didn't quite get where it was supposed to go. <laughs> and it's, it cries. It's emotional. Yeah. So even as a kid, I couldn't have told you this 50 years ago, but I felt it. So Journey to the Center of Mine was an offshoot of what my band, The Lourdes, in 1960 and mm -hmm. 61 and 62, learned from a band called Billy Lee and the Rivieras, who changed their name to Mitch Ryder and the Detroit yeah. Wheels. And so when I picked up the guitar, I just started that pad. And I was hip to the jazz guy. And here's that noise, that whining. And I didn't know what the notes were. I had no musical training. I learned a lot from Joe Pedorsa. <laughs> you know, just the dirty, yeah, yeah, funky yeah. stuff. But it, when you play, all, and we did, I played all the time. Playing was number one. In yeah. Journey to the Center of Mine, I didn't write the lyrics. I had no idea what Steve Farmer was doing um, <laughs> intoxicant-wise. I thought that the title is a kind of a play on Journey to the Center of the Earth. It's unthinkable, but it must be true. A man took some tools and went where no human being had ever set foot. Journey to the Center of the Earth, adventure probing unknown territory. Journey to the Center of Mine, I, I was clueless on the drug scene. So Journey to the Center of the Mind, I think it still holds true for me today. All right, Journey to the Center of the Mind. I think once in a while, Adam, we should take a deep breath, pause, and take a journey to the center of our mind and ask ourselves, are we using God's gifts to the best of our ability? Are we benefiting our family and our neighbors? Are we an asset to our country? Are we producing to the best of our ability? That's what Journey to the Center of the Mind meant to me. To you, yeah. yeah. I don't think that's what I meant to Steve. <laughs> I think he was going with the LSD excursion into the unknown <laughs> Timothy Leary zone. So, uh, and then they, they came up with the, the album cover with what I eventually discovered were dope smoking bong. So I thought it was just modern art because it was uh, Peter Max and op art back right. then. And I thought, okay, um, blown glass artwork in various colors. Okay, and, and so the song became a smash, and that orchestration with it. I wrote that bass line that Greg Arama, God rest his soul, took to heavenly 
James Jamerson, Bob Babbitt, Funk Brother Heights. Greg Raymond was a, a walking miracle genius piece of music. Dave Palmer on the drums was so syncopated in groove. And I think at that time it was Rick Lober on the piano and, uh, and Andy Solomon became, started playing the B3 and Steve had a wonderful musical approach. John Brake on the, the baritone lead, but I'm very proud of that music. For a bunch of teenage kids, that had a lot of class and a lot of adventure to it. And we played it tight. We were already James Brown in it. Come along if you can. Come along if you can. And I think everything, if you ask me about any year in my music life, what I just explained about the eruption of Journey to the Center of the Mind as a piece of a musical statement, as a, uh, as a formula of how bandmates pay attention and communicate with each other and care deeply about the musical presentation. Center of the mind. Well, it's one thing to write one song that rocked the world, but to write a few of them that rocked the world that still resonate 30, 40 years later. Let's talk about Cat Scratch Fever. Killer Lick. So I was talking about honky tonk and boogie yep. woogie origin. Everybody's got to learn that. Or, Let's spend the night together. <laughs> honky tonk. I just put a whole chord to it. You gotta have that quiver, you know, that 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 fleck. And so it's just an extension and a bastardization of what is the nucleus of all great music, either honky tonk or boogie woogie. I'm a stream of conscience guy. I've been clean and sober for 66 years. The real important things in life turn me on, laughing and bands communicating and people dancing wildly like animals to the music you create with you. There's a sexuality. So Cat Scratch, even Wango Tango, Wang Dang Sweet Poon Tang, yeah. every song on Shut Up and Jam, everything matters. Fear itself, even Shut Up and Jam. Shut Up and Jam! <laughs> Every song has a sensuality to it. Maybe not a specific sexuality, but a sensual prod. It prods the senses. You can't have a Ted Nugent piece of music without somebody going, what's that? Turn that up. I'm very, very proud of that. My communication with my fellow music lovers, some people call them fans, I call them fellow music lover blood brothers. The over the top passion I get from the people that love my music is so inspiring and so humbling. It's as if they wrote them. I've never sat down with a piece of paper and a pencil and gone, well, it's time to write a song. I've plugged into an amp and I've started playing and a song happens. When you came in, I was doing something like, um, song. That will be cultivated. That will turn into a song on my next record. Well, you said recently, don't learn scales. I think the reason that my music uh, resonates with so many is because it's so unique. It's so stylized because I'm not that good. <laughs> it's my point <laughs> being is that all my buddies could learn all the Chuck Berry licks way better than I could. And so I'd like fumble and bastardize them, and I could, you know. <laughs> uh, now I can do it, but I couldn't do it then. Right. So my bastardized version of what they were doing sounded different. 
Cat Scratch Fever, I mean, it's been covered by a diverse amount of people from yeah. Pantera to the replacements yeah. to Anthrax, Slash. <laughs> It's what every guitar player wants to do. I mean, you right. could go. I mean, you know. And, you know. Wang Dang, Sweet Poon Tang, and on the new record. You know, when I wrote that song, I sat down, plugged into an amp, turned it on, and I played that. I played the whole song, and I went, that's a song. Get up every day with a smile on my face. Happy to be alive, and I'm back in the race. I don't believe that talk is cheap. You play your cards, and you read them, and weep. I just started singing that. I didn't contemplate a subject matter. Because the music turns me on like I'm that kid listening to Bo Diddley in 1960. I'm lucky, 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 lucky. Leave us a comment about Uncle Ted, Ted Nugent, and Cat Scratch Fever, one of the greats of the 70s. Tell us below what your thoughts are, uh, your memories of the song. Make sure to subscribe below and hit the bell so you never miss out uh, if you like this content. And uh, make sure to check us out on Patreon, our merch. Help us keep the music alive. That is the goal, as always. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. We'll talk to you very soon.